Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending wherever or whenever you are watching this. This is Amanda Walker and I'm here to talk to you about symptom control and palliative care principles. And so today we're going to do a brief revision of the principles of symptom management and a bit about nausea and vomiting. If you want this information in greater depth, there is a lecture that we did in year two, just before the OSCE that you can refer to. Then we'll also talk about pain, dyspnea, constipation, and caring for the dying patient. So just a reminder about symptom pathophysiology. So the best symptom management depends on treating the cause of the symptom. And I know that sounds a bit basic, um, but it's actually really important. A lot of people will just try and treat, try and treat cancer pain, but they won't contemplate how the cancer is causing the pain. And the way the cancer is causing the pain makes all the difference. And in line with that, the symptom pattern that a patient experiences depends on where the disease is located and what the cancer is impacting on. And that's why the staging and clinical information is so important, because you need to understand whether the information you already have explains the symptom that the patient is experiencing, or do you need to actually investigate further to confirm that the cancer is spread and to identify the cause so you can attempt to treat it. Now the goal, wherever possible, is to rule out or treat whatever is reversible. And what you cannot reverse, you then palliate. And the general principles of drug use, you need to understand the mechanism of the symptom and the action of the drug. So it comes back to that, understanding the mechanism of the symptom. The other thing is that persistent or recurrent symptoms require regular medications, not just PRN. PRN technically stands for pro res necessitas or pro re nata, which means as the thing requires. But in real life, it probably stands for patient receives nothing or pain relief never. And that's because you're waiting until someone's in pain or experiencing a distressing symptom before you give them something. And if you know that the tumour is going to be causing the pain continuously, it's pretty cruel and probably a bit unethical to leave someone actually just experiencing the pain before you bother to give them something. Having said that, you always give regular plus PRN in case they need a touch more. So nausea and vomiting. As I said, we covered this in second year, but I just wanted to quickly revise the principles of antiemetic choice which comes back to identifying what you think is the cause of nausea and vomiting in the patient, identifying the pathway by which each cause triggers the vomiting reflex, identifying the neurotransmitter involved in the pathway, choosing the most potent antagonist to the neuroreceptor transmitter, sorry, to the neurotransmitter receptor identified, and if, sorry, if several mechanisms are involved, using the most potent for each, rather than one with weak actions against many. So you go for the strongest one, not the smatigan approach. Choose the route of administration which will ensure the drug reaches the target site, and this may exclude oral. Titrate the dose regularly, and review the patient regularly, and give them antiemetic regularly. If symptoms persist, you need to consider another cause. And sometimes causes can change in the course of time. So, just a reminder, there's four different ways you can activate the vomiting center. So the gut, the cerebral cortex, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, and the vestibular system. And they all activate the vomiting center, which coordinates the process of vomiting. So there are five questions you need to ask. Is it worse with the sight or smell of food? In this case, it's central nausea. Is it worse with eating food? most likely to be gut nausea. Is it worse in the morning with other signs of increased intracranial pressure? Um, for example, headache or other cranial nerve signs. So that's classically an increased intracranial pressure, kind of nausea and vomiting. Is it worse with movement, which means it's most likely cranial nerve eight? And does it build up until you vomit and then get better after you vomited, which is likely to be from the gut? Or do you just keep retching and keep vomiting and vomiting and vomiting until you've got nothing left to vomit? And that's central nausea. So again, if you want to go into that in more depth, go back to second year. So 
once you've determined which of these four centers are activating the, ves the vomiting center, then you need to work out what's the most powerful neurotransmitter. And this is where we look at things like metoclopramide is actually a mild dopamine antagonist, but haloperidol is a strong dopamine antagonist. In terms of antihistamines, cyclozine is a really strong one. And then in terms of um, muscarinic antagonists, hyacinhydrobromide is the strongest. 5-HT3 antagonists, well, ondansetron, trapezotron, all of them are clearly the strongest ones. In really high doses, metoclopramide is actually a 5-HT3 antagonist. And 5-HT4 antagonists, well, cisipide is the strongest one, but it can actually um, prolong a QT interval. So we tend to use metoclopramide as the primary agent. Cisipride is only available in the special access scheme. And this, again, is just another way of looking at the same issue. So if the cause is drugs or metabolic related nausea and vomiting that's activating the chemoreceptor trigger zone, then dopamine and 5-HT3 antagonists are effective. If it's due to motion and position, the vestibular system is the cause and therefore antimuscarinic and antihistaminergic agents. If it's from the viscera, so the abdominal organs, then dopamine and 5-HT4 agonists. And if increased intracranial pressure, it's through the cortex and antihistamines are effective. But we also use dexamethasone to try and decrease the swelling around a tumour. And all of these agents work on the vomiting centre, which then coordinates the process to the effector organs and hopefully slows down the vomiting reflex. So there's a big sign with a bar through the 5-HT3 antagonist because I just want to remind you, as you go out to practice, you will see so many people who reach for ondansetron and trapezotron as first-line antiemetics because they assume that because they work for chemotherapy, nausea and vomiting, they must be the strongest ones and they must be the best and they'll use them for any kind of nausea and vomiting. And the problem is that they're really good at what they do for nausea and vomiting for chemotherapy and anesthesia and radiotherapy, but they you know, they make people constipated. And if someone is nauseated and vomiting because they've got a bowel obstruction, this will make it worse. Okay? And you need to be really careful when you choose to use them. Okay? So please don't reach first for your 5-HT3 antagonists. Reach first for the appropriate drug. You guys know this better. So on the ward, I just want to remind you to watch how antiemetics are prescribed and adjusted. And if you have any questions or concerns, go back to the year two lecture. So on to pain. Again, some general principles. Believe and acknowledge the complaint of pain. And I cannot underemphasize. Empathy, explanation and reassurance have a profound pain relieving effect. I am astounded how often when a patient comes in to be admitted and they're in significant distress with a lot of pain and you sit down and you take their history and you listen to what is disturbing them. Before I've even gotten out my pen to chart the analgesic, before the nurse has gone to the cupboard to get the analgesic, they're already starting to feel better because they feel like someone has heard them and that someone is going to do something about it. And just relieving that anxiety can make a huge difference. Remember, noradrenaline and adrenaline are, neuro, are pain neurotransmitters. And easing someone's anxiety can make a huge difference. Always use the minimum dose required to relieve the symptom. And side effects should be anticipated and prevented wherever possible. Simplicity is the essence. So always use the oral route wherever possible, unless the patient is not able to transmit that is not able to tolerate nor, um, oral analgesics. If you hear purring, this is now my cat sitting on my lap. So say hello, Tenzing, to the lectured students. Hello, purr. Okay. So simplicity is the essence, and the oral route is preferable where possible. In order to prescribe opioids safely and appropriately, you need to understand that there are new formulations of opioids. 
So immediate release and sustained release. You also need to know that there's a whole series of new opioids actually available and you need to understand the differences between those newly available opioids. And you need to be aware of the conversions between them. So you need to know that hydromorphone is five times as strong as morphine. You need to be able to write accurate and valid opioid scripts and you need to be able to seek assistance when required. That's probably the most important thing, to know your limits. So, the approach to pain management. I just want to point out a little five-step approach. The first is, where possible, decrease the noxious stimulus with local treatments. So if something is inflamed, ease the inflammation. Improve threshold issues. And by threshold issues, I mean the things that are making people distressed and anxious. And this is where cortical override can make a powerful impact. So listening to someone, addressing their anxiety, their depression, their distress. Exploit the opioid receptor system. We have a God-given or evolutionarily derived, whatever you believe, um, opioid receptor system, which means that we have a built-in system which actually decreases the amount of pain we experience. Pain is supposed to be an early warning system, an alarm. It shouldn't be prolonged. So you actually need to activate the opioid receptor system to decrease the experience of pain in the spinal cord and the cortex. And then you need to recognize and manage the really tricky kinds of pain, like neuropathic pain, which are unusual and slightly different. And you need to do this by enhancing descending inhibition, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. And the final thing is return and review the patient. Again, we covered this in the second year, but it's important revision. So in terms of what you're actually doing with these five points, so in terms of local therapies, heat packs, massage, tens, acupuncture, anything that decreases the local perception of pain. There are some recent studies which suggest that acupuncture is probably not effective. Then consider threshold issues, anxiety, depression, other stresses in life. And if you have advanced cancer, chances are you'll have a few other stresses in your life. And it's worth trying to get to the bottom of them. And if you're not the right person to do that, then get a social worker or a counsellor, someone who is. Then exploit opioid receptors. So using the medications regularly, plus PRN. Oral if possible, and always anticipating side effects. Like constipation, the possibility of nausea and vomiting, etc. Adjuvant therapies. So for neuropathic pain, you need to bring in the extra things. For bone pain, you need to bring in other extra things. So for example, for neuropathic pain, tricyclics, anticonvulsants. For bone pain, bisphosphonates. And then return and review. And partly because this is probably the best time. The, the, when you have sorted out someone's pain, they are so grateful. It's such a powerful stimulant. I ended up doing palliative care. The, but if it hasn't worked, it's really important to then consider, do you need to titrate upwards or do you need to escalate and get someone who knows what they're doing to consider something like opioid rotation? So we don't expect you to do opioid rotation. We expect you to notify us that you, what you're doing is not working. So here are the nociceptive pathways. And I just wanted to remind you about the concept of descending inhibition. So you've got... Um, pain transmitted from A delta and C fibers in the periphery and it goes along and then it actually um, is transmitted at synapses in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Now this is where there's actually some strong opioid activity and so if the message comes in from the periphery along those A delta and C fibers and then it gets to the dorsal horn and if you're taking opioids you perceive the pain at the periphery, but once it gets to the spinal cord, the message is not transmitted. It's an inhibitory activator, and so the message is not transmitted to the spinothalamic tract, which decussates and heads up to the brain. And so basically the brain is saying, and you can't see me actually plug my fingers in my ears as I do this, but not listening, not listening, not listening. And it's just ignoring the messages, and the messages stop going through to the brain. The other place that we're opioids actually act is in the midbrain 
in the periaqueductal gray and the dorsal raphae nucleus. And it's enhancing what's called descending inhibition. And that, again, is the brain saying, not listening, not listening, not listening. Because descending inhibition is actually a pathway which increases inhibition at that same synaptic level. Okay? So again, you've got this nice little loop which is actually shutting off the message. Don't want to hear it. Not interested. And it's the same thing that happens if you, for example, have a runner's high. Personally, I'm not very familiar with them. But if you have endogenous opioids, they activate descending inhibition and you no longer get the messages from your tired, painful legs that running this marathon is hurting me and it's actually stopping the transmission of the painful impulses back to the brain. And when you're looking at things like tricyclics, they're actually increasing the descending inhibition pathway. Anticonvulsants or neuromodulators are decreasing the transmission along any of the nerves. So opioids. These are some beautiful Tasmanian poppy farms. We have um, Australia is the world's leadest, leading producer of medicinal grade opioids. And these are beautiful Tasmanian poppy fields and you can see the, the fields are carefully ringed. They're actually ringed by electric fences to keep the, f the cows out, which has led to the hilarious headline in the Hobart Mercury, stoned wallabies making crop circles, because wallabies were able to jump over the electric fences and then they would eat the poppy hips and they would be affected by the opioids. Now, there are lots of opioids out there. These are just solid, so not liquid or injectable, but solid oral morphine and oxycodone products. So there's a whole bunch of different options. And you can see that there's immediate release tablets, there's sustained release tablets and sustained release capsules by different companies and the same for oxycodone. And when I was a medical student, there was oral morphine and there was injectable morphine. None of these slow release tablets existed. Um, and you'll find that a lot of your consultants are not actually that familiar with all the different options out there. And this is one company's options. So this is one company, Mundi Pharma, which makes MS Contin and Oxycontin and Delorded. But they are by no means the only analgesic company. And you'll realize very quickly that the names, the logic of the names changes between companies. So this company uses Contin to designate that it's a sustained release product. But the makers of Tramadol call... Trammel is the immediate release form and Trammel SR is a sustained release form. So you need to get familiar either with the products or with looking up MIMS to check whether the product is short acting or long acting. And if it says it lasts four hours, it's immediate release. If it says it lasts 12 hours, it's sustained release. So just to do a quick run through of all these different ones, Oxycontin, sustained release. Audin 2 is immediate release morphine syrup. Duragesic, is the ultimate sustained release delivery system. That's the analgesic patches. Oxynorm capsules are immediate release. Morphine sulfate is morphine for injection. Capanol is sustained release. And it's actually a little capsule filled with granules. And you can actually break open the capsule and sprinkle it on yogurt or ice cream if people have swallowing difficulties. Tramel is immediate release tramadol. Fizeptone is the company's brand name for methadone. Delorted injections are uh, immediate release injections. Severidol is immediate release. Rapidine obviously is immediate release. MS Contin is sustained release. Junista is sustained release hydromorphone. Endone is immediate release. Tramel SR is sustained release tramadol. Panadine Fort is immediate release. It's codeine with paracetamol. And it's 30 milligrams of codeine, whereas panadine and rapidine are 8 milligrams. Audine 5 is Audine 5 milligrams per mil. Interestingly, Oxynorm 5 is Oxynorm 5 milligrams per 5 mils. MS Mono is daily morphine. Morphine tartrate is morphine for injection. And Oxynorm liquid is immediate release oxycodone.